morning. How's everybody doing? Am I still on? Am I good? All right. Sorry, we're running a little bit behind. We're having some technical difficulties. Um, we'll be live and live streaming on Facebook today, but not YouTube. Right away, YouTube will be avail available later on this afternoon. So if you have any friends or anybody that likes to watch it on YouTube, you might want to shoot them a quick text and say, switch to Facebook or it'll be available later on. But um, a couple quick announcements. I've been asked a lot this week about children's ministry and music. And these are two things that we are hoping to start back in some capacity soon. It may not look exactly like what we've done in the past, but but really, really soon. Wendy and I were talking this, I guess yesterday, day before, about doing something for the kids next week. And we'll see how that goes. We're going to try, try to line something up. And as far as music, uh, I've, I'm kind of spoiled. We've been spoiled for so long with, with live music. We've had such talented musicians and, and vocalists and everything, and I guess in my mind, I want to see that again. And right now, uh, we don't necessarily have the personnel to do that. Uh, so if anybody's watching or, or listening here that has talent, musical ability, plays instruments, all that kind of stuff, we'd love to have a conversation about how we can do music moving forward. But um, we would like to do music in some capacity, whether it's just putting something on YouTube and having an opportunity to, to sing and to worship through music. I think that's a powerful um, means of, of worshiping God. So we're going we're gonna to try to do something next week after the service. So it may not look like what, what it usually looks like, but we want to do something. So anyway, hopefully that answers a, a few questions people have had about children's ministry and, and uh, music. Because I know children's ministry in particular is something that I've talked to several people that are like, man, I'd love to come to church, but you know, my kids aren't going to sit through 45 minutes of your, your talking. So, um, and I get it. My son asks me every single week, dad, do I have to stay in here? Um, but we, we would like to have something for the kids. So anyway, we'll probably be aiming more towards elementary school, at least to begin with. That's not saying if your child is preschool, they can't come and participate in some capacity. But we'll probably start with elementary school because that's the biggest group we can we can minister to. So anyway, let's go ahead and pray. And then we'll jump right into the scriptures today. Super excited about today's message. Um, not necessarily because of the topic. When you hear the topic, you may have mixed emotions as well, but really excited to get into it. So let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to gather in your name. Um, Lord, I, I, I'm growing more and more and more to appreciate Sunday morning and, and what you have in mind for Sunday morning. That as, as difficult as it's been to sort of transition these last several months and through all these different things going on in society and restrictions and all that kind of stuff, um, I believe you are working and that you're doing something through every single bit of it. And I know part of that is, is helping us to get to a greater understanding of what the church really is. That when we gather here on Sunday mornings, it's not, it's not just a program. It's not just a routine. It's not just a religious activity. It's not a meeting like other social groups. That uh, when we come together, Lord, it is a privilege to come together to, to worship you, to recognize who you are, to hear from you and experience you, and to do it together. Um, and, and these are the things that are most important. So whether we're missing some of the normal parts of a service are not, um, that's not really what's important. What's important is you and each other and the fact that we can still come here, we can still get into your word, we can still um, sing songs of praise to you, we can still fellowship together is what really is important. So I'm thankful for the fact that I think you're drawing our attention to that more and more uh, closely uh, as the weeks and months go by. So anyway, Lord, we are thankful to be here today and we just pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds to receive the message that you have for us this morning. I believe, again, that it's it's has the potential to be transformational in the way that we live our lives and in the way that we serve you. So anyway, we do love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so we'll start off in Acts chapter 2 again. Um, this will be the last week of, of looking at the church. After this week, um, I've been praying about where we're going to go from here. Um, I have a feeling we'll probably jump into one of one of Paul's letters to, to the churches and maybe break that down. I, I enjoy topical um, preaching, which is what we've been doing the last several months now, I guess, where I just I pick a topic like the church and we talk about it. But I really like expository teaching. That's that's my favorite thing to do is open up the Bible and and break it down and say, what exactly is God telling us here? So we'll probably jump back into that next week or the week after. Um, and then we'll see where we're going from there. But today we'll finish up in Acts chapter two. We'll read 42 through 47 again, as we've done several weeks here in a row. And then um, we'll finish up the last characteristic. For the past five weeks, we've been talking about char characteristics of, of the early church. When we look at Acts chapter 2, that's what is being described. Luke is telling us what it looked like to be a part of the body of Christ in the first century. 
right? And I believe that it gives us a really good model to look at and say, man, what should the church look like today, right? There's lots of different um, opinions on what churches should look like and certainly lots of different services that if you come here on a Sunday morning, it's going to look very different than the Methodist church down the street or very different than the Baptist church or very different than the Pentecostal church or whatever. You'll go to all these churches and there's different looks and different flavors. And, um, and I think that's fine. I think that's fine. I think the key is not necessarily the method that we use, but the principles that we're using. Why are we getting together? You know, when we look at the, at the first century church, and we look in the book of Acts and we, we see the things that we've been talking about, whether it's worship or prayer or all the, these are things that should be consistent in every church we go to, right? Every gathering of God's people. This should be, a, this is what it looks like. Again, it may look a little bit different in how it plays out, but at, at its heart, at its basis, these things should be seen in the church. So let's, Let's take uh, one last look at it this week. So verse 42 says this. They, meaning the, the, the followers of Jesus, believers in Jesus, Christians, says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many, many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All right, so for the past five weeks, we've talked about um, five principles, four of which I think are really kind of explicit in, in the passage itself, and then one maybe isn't quite as clear. And we'll look at the sixth today. So the five we've looked at is this. Um, teaching, we, we label that instruction. Uh, the early Christians were devoted to the word of God. They were devoted to the Bible. They were devoted to the scriptures. They wanted to know what the Bible said, right? They were devoted to fellowship, being together, walking this thing out together, investing in one another's lives. Um, the breaking of bread, we talked about communion and the fact that, that that is worship. When we take communion, when we drink the drink and, and eat the bread, we're remembering Jesus's body and his blood on the cross poured out for us, for our sins that we may be forgiven. Um, and we acknowledge um, how, how that is the most important thing in our lives, right? That is what worship is. We talked about prayer. And then we also, also talk about service, serving one another. So those are the five principles we talked about. And today we're going to talk about the sixth, and we're going to talk about evangelism. And I don't know what pops in your mind when you hear the word evangelism. Maybe nothing. If, you, if you're more someone that maybe grew up in church, so maybe that word doesn't mean anything to you. Um, if you have, maybe uh, you have certain images that pop into your mind. When I hear the word evangelism, I think about knocking on doors and telling people about Jesus. Right? I think that maybe has something to do with the era that I grew up in, and that was a popular way you evangelized. Right, You go out and you knock on somebody's door and ask them, hey, if you were to die today, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? That kind of question. Um, and maybe that's intimidating. Uh, I'll, I'd be curious to find out how, well, I'll ask the question. How many people find evangelism, telling people about Jesus, intimidating? Anybody? A couple people. Everybody else is boldly confident in sharing their faith. Um, I am not, right? And you may say, well, good grief, you're a, you're a pastor. You should be really confident in doing that. I'm not. It scares me to death to share my faith with people. But maybe not for the reasons that you think. Okay, for me, um, it's really easy to stand up here. It's sort of, which for most people probably it's backwards. You're probably thinking, no, it wouldn't be easy for me to stand up there. It's much easier for me to stand up here and talk about Jesus and how much I love Jesus than it is to talk to people one-on-one -on -one about Jesus. Right? And, it's, and it has nothing to do, I'm not afraid to talk about Jesus to people as far as... Um, I, I love talking about Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm not afraid to tell people that I love Jesus. So that doesn't scare me at all. But what, uh, what I am a little bit intimidated by is I don't want people to think that I'm, I'm pushing it on them. You know what I mean? Like I was exposed to that, not personally where people did it to me, but I, I've seen people that, that do that, that really force Jesus on people. And I've seen the, re the reaction. And I'm just like, man, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that guy that people are like, oh gosh, he's going to tell me about Jesus in a way that's pushy or overbearing. You know, so that's what scares me about it. And there is a part of me that's afraid that I don't know the answers. You know, anybody share that same fear that what if they ask me a question? And I don't know the answer to it. So that's another. And, and I, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to have all the answers. So then I'll really look stupid. Um, so that's intimidating. So I think when we hear the word evangelism, sometimes we, we, we're like, oh, gosh, uh, telling people about Jesus. That kind of that kind of concerns me. I'm hoping that today as we begin to look at what evangelism is, that we'll become much more comfortable with it and much more confident in our ability to share the gospel to share the good news with other people, all right? So let's look at this. 40, verse 47 is the one we're going to focus on uh, this morning. And, 
And one of the things that I really love about this passage is the fact that the word evangelism isn't used, right? So it's not as obvious maybe as some of the other ones. Prayer is right in there. Fellowship is right in there. But where do we get evangelism from in this passage? Verse 47 says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. All right. How many people know that that is supposed to be a concern of ours? Seeing people get saved. Seeing people come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. As the body of Christ, that is one of our our primary goals. We were talking this morning, um, Jim and Nathan and I were talking about sort of the simplicity of, of what God has given us to do. Not that it's always simple in carrying it out. That can be very complicated. How do, we, how do we live these principles in our lives? But basically, Jesus makes it pretty simple, right? Jesus says basically two things. Come and go. Come and go. He says, come, follow me. So each and every one of us has been given an invitation to follow Jesus, to be like Jesus, to accept Jesus, okay? To live our lives um, living out the teachings of Jesus, living out the power of Jesus in our lives, right? So we're to come to him, but then he also gives us another command, and that is to go, right? To go, to go to minister to other people, to go and make disciples, right? Luke 19, chapter, uh, verse 10, is going to tell us that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's a pretty succinct um, mission statement, right? Why did Jesus come to earth? To seek and to save the lost. As followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be imitating Jesus, which means our lives become like his, our mission in life is to be his mission, is the same as his mission in life. So we are to seek and to save the lost. So not only do we come to him, but we also go to help other people come to him. Does that make sense? Uh, Matthew four nineteen, Jesus says this, hey, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. We've heard that verse, right? In that one verse, there we have our mission statement. Come follow me and then I'm going to teach you to go and fish for men to, to help other people to fall in love with me. That's our mission in life, okay? Um, Matthew 20, 28, 19 is known as the great commission, the great instruction where Jesus says, Hey, go and do this. I'm giving you authority to go out and do this. I want you to go and make disciples. What's a disciple, a follower of Jesus, right? So we come to Jesus, we become a follower of Jesus and immediately we're given a job and that job is to go out and help other people become followers of Jesus. Okay. We see this happening in Acts chapter two. We see people getting saved. We see people coming into a relationship with Jesus, but the question becomes, how does that happen, right? We don't, we don't necessarily see anything about evangelism in here, do we? Do we see anything about sharing the gospel with anybody? Do we see that, the, that the, the early Christians went out, they went and they shared the gospel with people? Does that, do we see that in the passage? We don't see it very blatantly, right? But the question is, is evangelism in here? We see people getting saved. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It says this, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. The word gospel here um, is a Greek word, Greek word, euagaleon, and what it means is the good news of God, to share the good news of God. So the gospel is where we get the word evangelism. It's the same Greek word, right? So we are to go out and share the gospel. That's evangelism. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. He says, so what's the power of God for salvation? What is the means that God uses to get people saved, to see people get saved? The gospel, the good news about Jesus. That's how people come to a saving faith. They hear the good news about Jesus and accept the good news about Jesus. All right, Mark 16, 15, 16 says this. He said to them, this is Jesus talking to his his followers, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. All right, so Jesus says, hey, go preach the good news. This is how people are going to get saved. This is how people are going to come into the kingdom. All right, so going back to verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, where he says, the Lord added to the numbers daily who are being saved. So the church is growing. People are getting saved. The question is, how are they getting saved? We just read that how people are going to get saved is through hearing the gospel, hearing the good news about Jesus. But we don't see that in this passage, do we, of Acts chapter 2, where people are preaching the good news. Or do we? Verse 47 starts off by saying, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, this is where Bible study becomes so important, and that's why I'm so always pushing, hey, get into the Bible, study the Bible. Don't just read it superficially, but get in there and find out what it says. You, will, you may not see evangelism in those first couple words of verse 47 if you don't dig into the passage a little bit. It says, praising God. Praising God. What, is it, what does the word praise mean? 
very simply, yeah, to lift up, to make a lot of God, to make much of Jesus, right? To lift Jesus up, to bless Jesus. That's what the praise means. When you praise something, if I praise you for doing a good job, what am I doing? I'm making a lot out of what you just did. I'm making over you. I'm like, man, that is such a good job. You did such a great thing. This is what we did. This is what they were doing with God. They were praising God. They were lifting God up. Okay. And then look what it says and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, the word favor there is the same word that we get the word grace. And it's usually used of God, right? Of God's grace. We talk about that a lot in our services. God's grace. But what does it mean? The word grace is the word cherish in, in, in the Greek. And what it means is to lean towards, right? To move towards, to lean into. So when we talk about the grace of God, it is literally God leaning towards us. And I don't know about you, but that is a, that is a beautiful image in my mind. Because I don't know about you, but there's not a whole lot to lean towards when it comes to me, right? God, I, have, I give God every reason to go, mm, I'm out. Good grief. I give God every reason to go, man. And yet God leans towards me. That should be such good news for anyone maybe who who doesn't know a lot about God, who doesn't really know a whole lot about how God works and how, how God thinks about us. But listen, God is leaning towards you, not away from you. You say, yeah, but you you don't know what I don't care what you've done. I don't care the life that you've lived. I don't care about that stuff. God is leaning towards you. He wants to show his favor to you. Right. So then how does that translate into this pass into this passage? It says they're praising God. They're making a lot of God and everything that they do, man, they're showing that this God is important to them. And it says they had the favor of the people. If favor means to lean into, that means what were people doing? People were leaning into them, leaning towards them, being drawn to them. OK, so the way that they were living their lives, they were living in such a way that people were they were looking in. They were leaning towards and say, well, hold on, what's going on with these people? There's something special about these people. There's something different about these people. What's going on with them? Okay. I believe this is at the heart of evangelism. Evangelism is living our lives in such a way that people are drawn to us to find out why we live that way. Does that make sense? All right. So now when praising God, how were they praising God? Here's the cool thing about it. We've already looked at it for the last five weeks. How were they praising God? What kind of lives were they living that caused people to lean towards them and ask about this God of theirs, right? They were engaging in teaching the word of God, fellowship, worship, prayer, service. These were the things that define their lives. These are the sources for us for evangelism. So do you want to be an evangelist? Anybody want to be an evangelist? Just to let you know, we're all supposed to be evangelists. So the answer to that question is yes. Yes, I want to be an evangelist. I want to tell people the good news about Jesus. I want other people to know that God is good. I want people to know what God has done for me. I want to know, I want people to know who Jesus is and what he's done, right? We want to do that. And here's the cool thing. It's not quite as intimidating as maybe you thought. The key to evangelizing to people is to engage in the word of God, in fellowship, in worship, in prayer, in service, All right? So let's look at each one of those. I want to, I want to, Take them in order except for the first one, the teaching, the instruction part, the Bible. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's put that to the side a little bit. Let's start with fellowship. Fellowship. How do we evangelize to people? How do we show people and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to people through fellowship? I I have had to have read this at some point in my life, but for some reason this week when I read it, it really hit me hard just how impactful this this statement is of Paul. 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Paul says this. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And I read that. Okay, wow. First of all, just starting with what Paul says, because we loved you so much. We're never going to share the good news about Jesus with people if we don't love them. Right? If we don't don't love people, we don't have this deep concern for them, this deep desire to see... um, to see them fulfilled and living the life that God has for them, we're never going to reach out to them. Okay, so, so evangelism, evangelism begins with love. Fellowship begins with love. I'm never going to get involved with you if I don't have a concern for you and a love for you. Okay, so that's the first thing. He says, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our, but our lives as well. When it comes to evangelism, we think about sharing the good news with Jesus probably far more than we think about sharing our lives with people. And what Paul is saying here is they go hand in hand. If I want to impact you, if I want you to see Jesus and hear about Jesus, 
I've got to get to know you. I've got to get involved with you. I've got to develop a relationship with you. I have to be willing to share my life with you. Okay? And the question was, how many of us are willing to do that? How many of us have people in our lives that we are willing to share our lives with? We live in a society that has become more and more separated, right? For all of our connecting technology and stuff, we are more separated now than we've ever been before. People are so rushed. We're busy. We got stuff going on. We don't have time to share our lives with people. We're more, I was talking with, with my mom and Terry yesterday about this. We're more willing to share our money with people than we are our time, right? Time becomes our most valued commodity. And what Paul is saying is, man, we got to be willing to share our time with people. We got to be willing to share our lives with people. We got to get involved with people if we want to share the good news with people, right? What's, what's that saying? I'm probably going to screw it up because I don't have it written down. Um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care, something like that, yeah. right? How do people know that you care? You spend time with them, right? Relationships are built through time. Are you willing to share your life with other people? If we want to, sh- want to share the gospel with people, want to share the good news about Jesus with people, we've got to be willing to share our lives, okay? There are some people that are willing to share the gospel or try to share the gospel and not share their lives, and how does that go over, right? Just to go up to somebody, I don't really care about you, and I'm demonstrating that I don't care about you, but I need to tell you that you are a sinner. <laughs> that usually goes over really, really well, right? I mean, we've got to, we've got to first tell, let people know that I am, I am leaning towards you the way that God leans towards me. Okay, I want to invest my life with you. First Corinthians nine, nineteen through twenty three. Paul says, though I am free, I belong to no no one. I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Here, here the goal of, of Paul's life in this. I want to win as many as possible. What is it? What is he talking about? What does it mean to win people to see people get saved, to see people in a relationship with Jesus? Right. He says, I want to win as many people as possible. I want to see as many people get saved as possible. He says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself uh, am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. And you say, well, good, I don't even know what the heck he just said. There's a lot of law and under the law. And he's going to sum it up for us. For slow people like me, he's going to sum it up. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might have some, might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. So what's he saying? He's saying, listen, I become like whoever I'm with. Does that mean he engages in sinful things, things he shouldn't be engaged with? No, but what it means is I learn, I, I learn to be like the people that I'm with. I engage where they are. I come to them. I don't expect them to come to me. Does that make sense? And we all do this to some degree, right? We all, when we get around a group of people, we, we generally try to conform to whatever group that we're in. So if I'm with people that are talking about sports, we'll talk about sports. If we're around people that talk about the weather, I'm going to talk about the weather. If I'm with people that talk politics, I walk away. No, I, but, but you know, you know what I mean? We, we generally do that anyway. But Paul is being intentional in this. He's saying, man, I, I look at people and I say, I want to reach them. I want to win them. For Christ, I want, I want to share the good news with them. I want to see them saved. So what do I do? I invest in them. I meet them where they are. I become like them. Right? And that's such, that's such a big deal. We, we, we don't stand above people. We don't stand outside away from people. No, no, no. We get right in where people are. Okay? That's what Paul says. Man, I want to win people for Jesus. I want to see people get saved. So I'm going to do what it takes to build relationship with them so that happens. First John 1 John 1.3 it says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, right? It's the gospel. We'll talk about that in a minute, what, what we've seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. Why is Paul sharing these things with people? Because he wants to experience fellowship with them. It's not just that I want to see you get saved. I mean, I, I think we all probably know people that will see people get saved, they get them to pray a prayer, and then they're out, right? That's not what we're called to. We're called to discipleship. Discipleship is done in the context of relationship, in the context of fellowship. So it's not just that we're going to drop the bomb of, of the gospel on people. Poof, you're a sinner. You need Jesus. Boom, I'm out. That's not what we do, right? We, we come in. We build relationship with people. We want to have fellowship with them. And that fellowship is, is, is um, around Jesus. It says, and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Okay? So we have to be willing to share our lives with other people, to get involved with other people. It's a great way to begin evangelism, build relationship with people, get to know people. All right? How intentional are we in that? 
How intentional are we in, in getting involved with people that we work with? People that we live around, right? We should be intentional in that. And not, not many of us are. And listen, life is difficult. It's tough, right? We get busy and, and um, we have lots of good intentions. I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to call so-and-so, I'm going to talk to so-and-so, I'm going to stop and see so-and-so, and the day goes by and I don't do it. We've got to be more intentional with that, and we've got to make it happen. If we wait for the opportunity, it will not happen. Right? How many people live around somebody? Maybe you have neighbors that you don't even know what their name is. Right? Man, we've been like that. We, and we, we've said it in every neighborhood we go in. We've moved, I don't know how many times we moved in a couple of years. It was a lot. And every time we moved, we were like, we're going to get to know our neighbors, and we're going to get invested with them. We're going to have dinner with them. We're gonna do, uh, we've been living in our neighborhood three years. Four years? How many times we had dinner together? Not many, you know. And we say it all the time. We're like, man, we need to invite Mandy over to have dinner. We need to sit out and have marshmallows or whatever. We need to do that kind of stuff. Same thing with Tyrell on the other side of us. And we want to, and we, we, we mean to, but life just consumes us. And before we know it, a day's turned into a week, and a week, a month, and a month, a year. And now three years. We've got to be intentional. We've got to be intentional about building relationship with people. We were talking this morning. Uh, I'm going to reference this guy a couple times, probably here this morning. Got to listen to this guy named Skip Gray. Worked for the Navigators, if you know that organization, for like 60 years. Super wise guy. I mean, just everything comes out of his mouth. You're like, golly day, you're so smart. Um, and one of the things that he talked about when I went to Colorado was this. He said, we have to understand that Jesus was a three-mile-per-hour God. And when he said that, I went, crap. I know exactly what that means. Right? How fast do people walk? Three miles per hour on average is how fast people walk. Jesus walked everywhere. We don't have any records of Jesus running, right? Jesus didn't ride a bike. He didn't jump in a car. He didn't do anything. Jesus walked everywhere that he went. One of, those, one of the stories Skip told was said, look at the scriptures. Jesus walked slow enough that a woman bleeding, basically bleeding to death, was able to come and touch him. So you weren't going to touch him if he's going 25 miles per hour. I am a... 75 mile per hour person right i just want to move i want to get going like i can't tell me how many times and and if i've done if i've done this to you i apologize um the one sitting in the front row um i i talk and do stuff at the same time right when i'm talking to you you got about you might have a minute or two <laughs> you all right, 30 seconds. You, you, got, you got a very short time before all of a sudden I'm going to be talking. I'm like, yeah, mm, yeah, I'm, I talked to her. And I'm doing other stuff, right? My daughter, my daughter's one of the main ones. My daughter stopped talking. She'll just stop talking to me. I'm like, I'm listening. She said, no, you're not. I'm like, I am. I can still hear you. She said, you're upstairs. <laughs> I'm not going to keep talking to you, right? And I'm going, she wants me to move at three miles per hour. Because that's where relationship is built. Right? You ever went on a walk with someone and talk with them? You can do that. You ever try to run and talk with them? How does that work out? Especially if you're running different speeds. Walking, we can have a conversation. Walking, we can build a relationship. What, what speed do you live at? Something else Skip Gray said. He said, don't live life in, in your passing gear. Right? In a car, you have that gear. Everybody knows that gear. You step on the accelerator and you're like, eh. And it speeds up, right? We, we're, not, we're not meant to live in that gear. We're not meant to drive in that gear, right? That's not good for your car. Everybody would recognize that. I was telling the guys this morning, or we were remembering this story. I went with Dirk Bond to Ohio one time, and we were taking his son-in-law's Jeep back um, to Ohio, and we were pulling it behind the red van. Anybody seen the red van that's parked out here? It is not a sports vehicle, all right? So we're towing this big old Jeep behind us, and we're going up the hills in like Pennsylvania and Ohio and all that kind of stuff. And you hear that van kick in. And we rode in that for like 30 minutes. And you're like, this isn't good. This, this thing is going to blow up. Right? And we all would recognize that. If somebody came by us, you would say, that's not, that's not good. Okay? And yet, we live our lives at that speed, don't we? We would recognize that that's not good for a vehicle. What do we think it's doing to our body? What do we think it's doing to our relationships? Okay, we're not meant to live our lives in this passing gear. We need to slow down. We need to be willing to walk. And, so, and that's, I know that's extremely hard because our society has demands. You've got to be efficient. You've got to be productive. And you've got to get stuff done. And you've got to have your list and all that kind of stuff. But, man, sometimes we just need to stop. 
need to be willing to say, I want to put that stuff on hold. Isn't it amazing how Jesus did that? I mean, it, it might be the same story, right, where Jesus is going to, to raise a dead person, right? The person's sick, and Jesus is on their way, and the person touches him, and Jesus stops. And I'm sure the disciples were like, we ain't got time for this, Jesus. Let's go. We've got important stuff to do. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. I need to stop right here. This woman needs me. Are we willing to do that in our lives? Are we willing to do that with the people that we come in contact with? Are we willing to do that on our jobs? Are we willing to do that in our neighborhoods? Are we willing to do that in our families? Right? Fellowship. Relationship. We are not going to impact people um, without relationship. All right? Uh, skip, skip, skip Gray, another quote of his. We impress from afar. We impact up close. That's pretty profound, isn't it? We impress from afar. People can look and say, man, he's such a good guy. He's such a good person. We're not going to impact them unless we get up close and personal. Okay? All right, so fellowship. Got to build relationship. Next one, worship. Worship. We looked at Mark 12, 30 several weeks ago. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Okay, this should be the, the attitude of our heart. This should be the posture of our heart, that God is first. That's what worship is. Worship is to ascribe ultimate value to God and say nothing is more valuable in my life than God. And this should show up in, in everything that we do, okay, not just at church. It's easy, isn't it? It's really easy to look and see that God is important to us in church. Somebody walked in here, they'll see us singing songs, and we'll have our Bible open, and you know we're saying amen, bless you, brother, and we're doing all that kind of stuff. It's easy for people to see that God's important when we're here. The question is, does, do people see that God is important when we're out there? Right? Do we see that God is the most important thing in our lives out there? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, so whatever you, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And I love that because eating and drinking seems pretty menial, doesn't, doesn't it? That doesn't seem very impactful. That doesn't seem like evangelism. It doesn't seem like sharing the gospel with people. But we do. When people see that there's something different about the way that we do even the smallest task, Right? Even the simplest thing in our lives, when people look and go, hold on, wait, this person seems different in doing that. They seem to value things that I don't seem to take very val- seem to be very valuable in my life. Right? First Peter 4.11, and this one hit me hard the last couple of days. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. Man, that's a pretty deep verse right there. And if you're going to speak, if you're going to open your mouth, do it as though you're speaking for God. You're speaking on God's behalf. That would change the way we speak, wouldn't it? Right? The other day, we're driving to, driving to school, <clears throat> and they're doing road work on 16. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so you feel my pain. You know the frustration. It's insane. I called Denny Todd, who works for the State Highway Association. I said, I'm, I know people in high places. I got to call him and put in a complaint. He's got, we got we to get this fixed. They're doing like three miles worth of highway with one lane, and you're stuck waiting for like 15 minutes for the other row of cars to come. And you drive two, three miles, and out of the three miles, they're only doing road work on three, 10 feet. And it's like, why do you have all this closed off? It's just, I'm sorry, I'm ranting. I'm going off. But, um, so anyway, so that's what I'm experiencing in the morning. It's the first day of Peyton getting to get on the bus. I'm all excited because I'm like, yes, I don't have to drive all the way down to his school. I can drop him off right there at Church Creek so he can go get on the bus and go. I got pickleball to play at 830. Super excited. I'm going to be on time to play pickleball. I mean, I'm just pumped up. And we pull up in this traffic jam. And I'm going, come on, come on. And as I got ready to rant, like I just did with Peyton in the back seat, I was like, no, nah, don't do it. Don't do it. It's not a good thing, man. You need to. Th- Speak as though you're speaking for Jesus. Jesus, and I'm going, okay, don't say it. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Right? And he's playing this music through the speaker thing, whatever he listens to. And it's horrible. It's terrible. Right? And, and I'm listening to it and listening to it and listening to it. And then finally I'm just like, Peyton, this is not a good time to play terrible music. It's not the right time. Right? So I'm, I'm all proud of myself because I'm like, I didn't flip out. I handled that pretty calmly. And he goes home and tells Wendy the story. And he's like, yeah, dad flips out and goes off because my music was terrible and told me to shut it off. And I was like, crap, why did I say anything? I, why couldn't I keep that quiet for the next five minutes, right? Why couldn't I have demonstrated patience? Why didn't I demonstrate patience in what I said? Because Peyton's watching. People are watching. They're watching us when we say things. And even the most simple little trivial thing that comes out of our mouth that we think, hey, it's not that big of a deal. People are watching. Right? Are they hearing Jesus or are they hearing a maniac? 
right? If anyone speaks, they should do, do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. What is the intention of our heart? When we do anything, do we want God to receive glory in what we do? That's what worship is. Worship demonstrates that God is the most important thing to me. It's not me. It's not anything else. When people see that, they are impacted by that, right? It draws them in to say, what is so great about this God that everything you do is for him? Worship, powerful means of evangelism. It's not just singing. We talked about that when we talked about worship. We've, we've been conditioned that worship means just singing. Is it? Is singing a way to worship? Absolutely. But so is eating. So is drinking. So is speaking. So is serving. All of these things are powerful ways to show that God is the most important thing in my life. And it, and it compels people to ask the question, why? Why is God so important to you? Powerful means of evangelism. Prayer. The next one, prayer. Acts 4.29. It says, now, Lord, consider their threats. Now, this is, this is we went over this a few weeks ago. These are, uh, this is Peter and John. They've been arrested and they've been released and they've been threatened. Shut up. Don't talk about this Jesus anymore. Don't share Jesus anymore. You need to keep, that, keep him quiet. You talk about it, you're in trouble. And what do they do? They come back and they pray. It says, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Do we pray that God will give us the words to share with people? Okay? So often we're so nervous. We're so scared. Man, what am, well, I don't know what I'd say to people. What if they ask me questions? What if I don't know the answer? How am I going to do this? Do we pray for boldness? Do we say, Lord... Give me the ability, the strength to be willing to speak up when the opportunity arises. Give me the words to share. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. This is what Paul is saying. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. He's talking to the church, talking to Christians. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Listen to what he's saying there. Pray that God would open the door to people. Pray that God would open the door for me to share the gospel. Do you pray for that in the morning? Do I pray for that in the morning? Do I wake up and say, Lord, I pray that you give me the opportunity to share the good news with people today. I pray that you would open the doors for the people in our church to share the gospel today. Can I tell you, I don't ever remember praying that prayer. Not for you. I prayed it for me. I prayed before and woke up and said, man, I'd like to share the gospel with somebody today. Lord, give me the opportunity to do that. But I don't know that I've ever prayed. Lord, open the doors for everybody in our congregation to share the you with other people. That's a powerful prayer. And Paul has told us to pray it. Are we doing that for one another? Okay. He says, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should pray that God would give me the words. I should be praying for you that as God begins to open doors in your life to share the gospel with people, that he would give you the words to speak them clearly, that people would understand them, that people will get it. He says, be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Most make the most of every opportunity. And that, that's a whole sermon right there, right, that I've been preaching. Make the most of every opportunity. How many people have, uh, have had opportunities that you know you missed? All of us, right? We all know that we've missed opportunities, and doesn't it suck? Like, I mean, honestly, this is how stupid I am. I have never regretted sharing the gospel with anybody. Never. I can, I can never say there's ever been a time where Jesus has said, hey, I want, you to, I want you to share this with somebody. I want you to talk about me with somebody. Even in crazy situations, it's been several years ago, but I can remember walking down this street back here and I was praying one of the few times, that's too rare, but I was praying, Lord, I'd like to be able to share the gospel with people. Open my eyes to see people around me. Open my ears to hear conversations and, and hear opportunities to share the gospel with people. And right then, the Lord said, I want you to pray for that lady getting in her car right there. I was like, I don't know that woman. <laughs> right? I meant share the gospel with people that I'm comfortable with and that I know, not just anybody. Said, I want you to go pray for that woman. I'm like, pray what? I said, oh, no, ask her. What? I don't know what this lady She's going to think I'm a nut. Come walking up, her and up, up on her and asking, can I pray for her? And I was like, all right, I'll do it. So I'll go over there, and I'm, I asked her, is anything I can pray for? And she's like, actually, I'm thinking about starting a business, and if you could be praying for that, that would be outstanding. And, and I prayed for her. Nothing weird happened. Nothing crazy happened. But I felt good about the fact that I was obedient, and I did what God asked me to do, Right? You compare that to the many, 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 many times that God has said, hey, I want you to pray for them. And I went, no. And then I'm like, crap. And I kick myself over it. I mean, I've told this story so many times. It's been 14 years. And, 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 and this is a couple times that I've said this now that the Lord spoke to me. 
God doesn't speak to me in an audible voice. So if you're like, God doesn't speak to me that way, he doesn't speak to me that way either. Okay, he speaks to me through just impressions and thoughts that would just jump into my head where I'm like, I, that, that wasn't me, where I know that that's God putting that in me, that inclination in me, that thought in me. Okay, so if you're sitting here thinking, man, I wish God would speak to me that way, he does. He does. He speaks to all of us that way. Sometimes it's just very subtle, very gentle. God doesn't always show up in the wind and in the storm, right? He shows up in a quiet whisper, okay? But um, I can remember being in the airport. I went with Doug Wooden, and we went out to Saddleback, and I had $100 in my pocket. And I was like, yes, I'm coming home with money. Anybody like that experience when you're coming back from somewhere? You still got money in your pocket? I was like, yes, I still got $100. And the Lord was like, I want you to give it to that security guard right over there. I was like, I don't know that dude. I'm not giving him my $100. Like, and, and this is coming off the heels again. I'm sitting in an airport. And I'm like, this has been such a good trip, Lord. Thank you for everything that you've shown me for all this. I mean, I'm thanking God, and I'm like, you know, I want to serve you. I want to be obedient to what you're saying. Okay, we'll give that guy that money. No, not in that. I want to be obedient in the normal, everyday stuff. I can't give this guy $100. And I know that's what he wanted me to do. And did I do it? No. And here I am 14 years later going, it's $100. You know how many times I've wasted $100? And I held on to it like it was my last $100 when I, I should have known that it, God gave it to me anyway. Like somebody probably did give it to me. To go on that trip, I probably didn't have any money. People probably gave me that money, and I could have just went, hey, it's not mine anyway. It's God's money. Instead, I held on to it. And now 14 years later, I go, why didn't I do that? No idea what God had for him or for me. No idea. And have no idea the blessing that I could have robbed that guy of and me of because I just didn't listen. Right? Just didn't listen. But are we praying for that? Are we praying for God to open up opportunities? Are we praying that God would give us strength to be obedient to do it? Right? God has all these wonderful opportunities for us to share the gospel with people. Prayer will open up the opportunities and, and give us the strength and boldness to do it. Okay? So prayer, so unbelievably important. Service. Service. Talked about this. Um, this was last week. Matthew five sixteen. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We should be serving other people in such a way that it points to God, not to us. Okay, so often I want I want I want to be glorified. I want people to pat me on the back and go, man, Jason's good job. You work so hard. You serve other people. I like that. Listen, is that a natural response? We all want to pat on the back. We all want to feel like we're doing something good. Yes. But at the end of the day, that that shouldn't be our motivation. Our motivation should be God. Right. Are we willing to do things even if no one finds out that it was us? Like I can tell you, there really is a, a tremendous blessing in doing that and doing something that you don't receive any credit for. Right, to be able to do something for somebody and then just roll out and let them have no idea who did it. It really is such a, a great feeling to know that it wasn't about me, that I really wanted God to receive glory from it. Galatians 6, 9 through 10. We looked at this one last week too. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. When we see reaping a harvest in the scripture, it has to do with people coming to faith. That's what reaping a harvest usually means in the scriptures, Right? to see people come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, man, keep doing good. Don't get tired. Don't get weary. You never know when, when that person's going to have a change of heart, a change of mind. Um, Joan Galtney tells, has told me this story a couple, couple different times. She had a friend of hers that her and her husband would always pray for and try to talk to about Jesus, and they were always like, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear about that. That's fine. If you want to believe that stuff, you go ahead and knock yourself out. I don't want to hear about it. You don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. And they, they just kept loving the guy and serving the guy and being there for the guy just time and time and time again until finally he got sick, right? He got sick and he was in the hospital. So they went just to see him, to say hi, thinking about you and everything and spoke with him for a little while just to cheer him up and got up to leave. And the guy said, aren't you going to pray for me? Right? So years, years of serving this man, loving this man, nothing. And then all of a sudden, boom, he says, will you pray for me? Right? So don't become tired. We never know when we're going to reap the harvest. We never know when God's going to show up and change, change their heart, when they're going to give in and soften their heart to God. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, there's our word again, have opportunity. How many people know there are opportunities all around us? They really are. They're there all over the place. Um, I have a friend of mine, Dan Rick, that I've got a lot of you guys have met. And I remember Dan coming to the church, and he had come a couple of times, and he was like, hey, let's go get some lunch. And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. And we went to... Um, Gosh, it was the pizza place that was up where the hardware store is or the auto zone place is now. And we went in there and we're having lunch and the waitress comes over and he's like, hey, what's your name? And she tells him, he's like, oh, well, 
Kathy, it's good to meet you. Kathy, is there anything I can pray for you about? I'm like, oh gosh, here we go. I'm like, man, come on, you don't, you don't have to impress me, man. It, it, you don't have to do that kind of stuff, right? And then I've had lunch with Dan a couple other times. In fact, in Colorado, we're there, and the same thing. Waitress comes up and he's like, hey, what's your name? Oh, Cindy, Cindy, is there anything I can be praying for you? And we're praying for Cindy and Cindy's brother who was having some physical issues and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, is this guy putting on an act? Or is this who he is? You find out, no, 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 no. This is who he is. This is who he is. There's opportunities everywhere. It's not just your waitress. If we, she's not there just to serve you. We can flip that around all of a sudden. Can I serve you? How can I help you? Right? Changes the whole dynamic of the encounter, doesn't it? Something that was just a meaning, meaningless, trivial task all of a sudden can become extremely significant in someone's life. These opportunities are all over if we're willing to take advantage of them, if we're willing to step out, if we're willing to put other people before us. All right? John 13, 34, 35. Uh, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another by this. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What's a great way for people to learn about Jesus, to hear about Jesus, to see the love of Jesus? Love each other. People are watching, right? People are watching. They're making a decision about God, making a decision about Jesus by what they see in us. We're supposed to be his followers. We represent him, right? When we truly love one another, we demonstrate how God loves us. And that speaks to other people, okay? Great way to evangelize. Came across this quote um, years and years ago. I heard this guy speak, Christopher Brooks. And he said this, good deeds leads to, the good, leads to goodwill, and goodwill leads to the good news. Right? Why do we serve other people? Why do we do good deeds for other people? To develop goodwill, a relationship. We build a relationship, and when we build a relationship, that will lead to us being able to share the good news with them. Right? So serving one another. And then this, this is the final one. Uh, instruction. Instruction. Um, most people have heard this some form of this expression before uh, always share the gospel and when necessary use words you may have heard that before um, good saying I like the saying uh, always be willing to share the gospel and when necessary use words and, and basically it's a, an expression that means hey have your life do the speaking for you make sure you're living a life that proclaims the good news of Jesus but the one problem that I have with, with that saying is words are necessary, right? All of these other things are absolutely necessary. We should be praying for people. We should be building relationship with people. We should be doing good deeds. We should be doing all of this kind of stuff. But at some point, words are necessary. We have to tell people about Jesus, okay? Faith comes through what? Hearing and hearing through the word of God. We've got to share with people the good news, okay? And I think that's where we begin to get intimidated, Right, begin to get a little bit afraid. Hold on, so now I've got to open my mouth and actually talk about it. Serving is fine. Loving on people is fine. But when it comes to actually talking about Jesus, man, I don't really know what to say. You know? I want to start here. First um, Peter 3, 15 to 16 says this. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That's, I love the fact that that's first. First, we've got to love God. We've got, we got to worship God. He has to be first. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, always be prepared to give an answer. Are you prepared to give an answer? You may say, well, I'm not really prepared because I don't know what the question is, right? What if they ask me a question I don't know, then I don't have an answer. He says, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. People should see a hope in you. They should see a hope in me. They should see the way that I live my life and say, man, there's something different about this guy. There's something different about this woman. Why does this person seem to have this hope and this joy and this peace that I don't seem to have? Why do they seem to have this love for other people that I just don't seem to have? Why do they serve other people in this way that is so selfless that I don't seem to have that? People should, should see something in us that causes them to ask, right? And we should be prepared to give them an answer. Why do we live our lives this way? He says, but do it with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior, see, they should see good behavior in our lives, and Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Okay, so now I want to start with this because every single one of us has an answer. Every single one of us has a hope, right? Where is our hope found? In Jesus, right? Where, that's where we find our hope. Everybody should look and say, man, why is your life so different? We all have a reason why Jesus has done something in my life. I was lost and now I'm found. I was dead and now I'm alive in him. That's good news. That should give every re one of us reason to have joy, to have peace, okay? 
Does, are our circumstances sometimes really, really rough and hard to get over? Yes. But we, we live with this assurance and this hope that one day this is going to be over and I'm going to live all of eternity with Jesus. That's the hope that I have. Right? And that hope should override everything else. And people should ask you about this hope. And we can tell them about Jesus and what we've experienced. Right? This is our testimony. Maybe you've heard that word before. Okay? Our testimony is simply our story of what God has done for us. And it's extremely powerful. Right? Do you know what every head of the dragon in the book of Revelation stands for? No. Who cares? Who cares? Is there a time and a place for that? I'm sure there is. But that isn't what the average person wants to know. Why are you so hopeful? Oh, because in the 16th chapter of... No, 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 no. What has Jesus done for you? That's what people want to know. We start with our testimony, and every single one of us has one. If we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we all have a story. We all have a story of who we used to be and now who we are. And we have to know that. We have to know that part of our testimony, right? But we should be able to share that with people. And part of that is practicing. Share your story with people. Talk to people about it, okay? But it can have powerful impacts on other people. Just your story, right? John chapter 9, one of my favorite stories in the scriptures. We have this man who's blind, right? And the, the disciples are like, man, Jesus, why was this guy born blind? Did he sin? Did his parents sin? What happened? He's like, no, no, no. It's not, this isn't a sin issue. This is a glory issue. This has happened that God will receive glory through his healing, right? So Jesus heals this man. And, of course, there's quite a commotion that begins to, to, to break out because of this. People were like, hold on, wait, isn't that the blind guy that's usually begging at the temple? And they're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, the religious leaders show up and they're like, hey, what's all this commotion about? And, of course, they don't want anybody talking about Jesus. So they're like, they go to the guy and they're like, hey, tell us what happened. The guy kind of explains it. Hey, this is where I was, and this guy Jesus came along, and all this kind of stuff. And they're like, no, 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 that, that can't be what it is. You know, tell the truth. Tell the truth about what's really going on. And they're pressing Jesus, and this is what we're all nervous about, right? We're all scared of that. That somebody finds out that we're a Christian, they're going to press us on. Well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And what about this? That's what they're doing to this guy. And this is his response. In, in chapter nine, verse twenty-five, he says, "He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, right? They're, they're saying, do you know this guy? Jesus is this. He's this. He's this." He says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, and now I see. That's our story, isn't it? Right? Somebody says, man, well, why, why do you have this joy? Why do you have this hope? Because I was blind, and now I see. I was dead, and now I'm alive. I was lost, and now I'm found. This is our testimony, John 4. Another popular story, Jesus is talking to this woman at a well, right? And, and, and they get talking, and he's talking about living water and all these kinds of things, talking about places of worship, and she's asking him all these questions, all these difficult questions. Um, and Jesus, Jesus begins to just build a relationship with her, begins to talk about her life, things that he knows about her, right? So then this woman leaves, verse 28, says, Then leaving her water jar, this woman has come to this well to get water in the middle of the day. Why? Because she's, she's someone who's had many, many relationships. She's living a life of sin. People have shamed her. She's living in disgrace. So she doesn't even come in the morning to get water when everyone else comes. She comes in the middle of the day trying to avoid them, right? Then she has this encounter with Jesus. She has this conversation with Jesus. And it says, in leaving her water, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, this is a woman who doesn't want to be around people until all of a sudden she meets Jesus, right? Runs back to the town and says this. Listen to what, what she says. Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? This woman has basically no information about Jesus other than he just told her something. He just had an experience with her, right? She can't break down the theology on who the Messiah is and how Jesus is the Messiah. She doesn't go back in the Old Testament and go, hey, this is the prophecy here. And uh, She doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. She says, this guy just started telling me stuff about me that he couldn't possibly know. You need to come and see. That's her testimony. That's her evangelism. That's what she shares. Verse 39, we skip down just a little bit longer and look what happens. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Why? Why did they believe in him? Because of the woman's testimony. Because she shared her story. It says, he told me everything I ever did. Listen, you have a story to tell. Are you willing to tell it? That story can be a powerful form of evangelism to share the good news with other people. Right to, to help them to see who Jesus is and to come into a saving faith of him. Your story, your testimony. Do you need all the answers in the scriptures? No. Does that mean that we shouldn't search the scriptures and try to get answers? No. Second Timothy 2.15. 
It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Do we need to get into the Bible? Do we need to study the scriptures? Absolutely. Do we want to get in there to find as many answers about Jesus as we possibly can to get to know him more, to be able to share that with other people? Absolutely, we should do that. But don't let that stop you, right? Don't let that stop you from sharing the good news about Jesus. I'll end with this quote. I love this quote by Skip Gray. That's what he says. There must be someone who knows less about God than you do. Find that person. I love that. Now, that's not the exact way he said it at the thing. He said, it has to be somebody that's dumber than you when it comes to Jesus. Find them. <laughs> right? What a great quote. There has to be somebody who knows less about Jesus than you do. Find them. Share it. Share what you know. If you only know a little bit about Jesus, that's okay. Does somebody knows nothing? You know more. Share it. All right? Share what you know about Jesus. That's evangelism. Evangelism is living a life before other people that causes them to see Jesus, not you. Right? Living a life before people that causes them to go, man, I want what you have. Right? To have them ask you, why do you live this way? And then our willingness just to share what God has done for us, what Jesus has done for us. That's evangelism. Are we concerned about people who don't know Jesus? Because we should be. Jesus was. The reason why we are here today, the reason why we are, we are saved is not because we are just the smart people. We're the good people. We, we, we did the right. No, 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 no. Jesus came and found us. Okay? He came and found each and every one of us. And he's called us to play a part in going to help find other people. That's evangelism. Sharing the good news with other people to see them come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Are we concerned about it? We should be. So if you don't know Jesus today, if you're sitting here, maybe you've, you've heard about Jesus. Maybe, maybe you've never heard about Jesus. Maybe it's the first time. Maybe you're watching the home and someone said, hey, you ought to watch this show or whatever. Watch this. No, it's not a show. <laughs> watch this. Um, watch this program. Watch this service. Watch this speaker, whatever. You know, and you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, I don't know. He, he, he seems to have something. He seems to have this excitement. And he, needs, he seems to have something that I don't have. Maybe, maybe you've seen other people. That, that live that kind of life, right? You can have it too. You can have it too. Right now, you can make a decision. I want to follow Jesus. Sitting in this room, maybe you've been coming to services forever and you've just never made that commitment where you say, man, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I know there is a God. I, I believe all of that. But maybe you've never made a decision to follow him, to say, I want to be, I want to serve Jesus. I want my life to look like Jesus. Today can be the day. Today's the day, and the great thing about it is there's no series of classes that you have to take in order to, to pass, in order to get into the kingdom of God. There's no, there's no requirement other than to say, man, I don't want to live the life that I've been living. I don't want to have control of my life anymore. I want to follow Jesus. I want God to be in charge of my life. And if you do that and you mean it and you have a true desire to follow Jesus, today's the day. You can be saved. You can be saved. And I would, I'll, I'll end with this and then we'll pray. There is nothing more important. There's nothing more important than making this decision. We're going to face lots of decisions in life that are important decisions. How we handle our money, who do we date, where do we go to, to, to live, what job do we have. Lots of important decisions. There is no decision we will ever face that is more important than where am I going to spend eternity. None. That is the most important decision we will ever make. And if we decide, man, I want to spend eternity with God. I want to spend eternity with Jesus. That decision can be made right now. Right? Made right now. So I would encourage you to do that. And again, we're not going to have any kind of special thing you got to do. You don't have to come to the altar if you, if you would like to be prayed for after the service. I would love to do that. I would love to talk with you if you've decided to make that decision. I would love to do that. But you can do it right where you're sitting now and say, Lord, I want to make that decision today. And when you do, your eternity is changed. Right then, you can become a child of God. So let's pray. Um, Father, I would love nothing more than for there to be people right now who enter into the kingdom, whose eternities will become secure because they'll put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that we, all of us have come to the reality that uh, religious activities isn't, isn't enough, um, trying to be a good person isn't enough, that the only way that we come into a relationship with you is through Jesus. I pray that we will recognize that, that we, we, are, we are sinners who cannot clean ourselves up good enough. We can't make ourselves good enough. And that is, that, that is the beauty of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is that you don't, you don't ask us to. You don't say, hey, you, we can be children of yours if we just clean ourselves up. We can be children of yours if we'll just start acting right. No, 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 no. You adopt us. 
um, because you love us. You come to us. You lean into us. That's what your grace is all about. Lord, you offer forgiveness and offer salvation, and all we have to do is accept it. Jesus paid the price on the cross. Jesus lived the life, the perfect life that you, you, you would have us to live. And we can have acceptance with you through his life, through his death on the cross, if we just merely put our faith and trust in it. So again, Lord, I would love for every single person under the sound of my voice this morning that's hearing my voice, whether here in the sanctuary or online listening somewhere, I pray that they would put their faith and trust in you, that today they would have a desire to be saved, that they would have a desire to go from being lost to found, from being dead to alive, that they would have the same testimony as this man in John chapter 9, as this man, I, I once was blind, but now I see. I would love for every single person hearing this today to have that testimony or to be able to share that, to have that confidence of knowing that they're in relationship with you. And Lord, for every one of us that, that's, that's in relationship with you, that has already made that decision and is following you already, that we will have a burning desire to see more people saved, that we have a burning desire to see more people entering into a relationship with you. And Lord, because of that burning desire, we will change the way that we will live that we live our lives, that we will have a, a desire to be transformed, that we would look more and more and more like Jesus, that our lives would look more like Jesus, that we would have the same impact on people that Jesus had. Um, give us that burning desire. Help us to not just be satisfied with, with, with just following, right? with just coming to you. Help us to also have a desire to do as you told us to do and go and share the good, <clears throat> share the good news. And Lord, I thank you for the fact that we can do that with every aspect of our lives, that the way that we live, the way that we, the way that we talk, the way that we... Um, do everything in our lives can be a means of sharing the good news with other people. So help us to understand that and live that way. So again, Lord, we just, we love you this morning and we thank you. And uh, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus name. Uh, Amen. Amen. And listen, I would like to say this. If you made the decision to follow Jesus today, I would love to hear that good news. I would love to hear that good news. I would love to talk to you about what that means and what the next steps are. And so if you're listening, are we still, are we still streaming? Um, if you made that decision at home, I would love for you to call the church. Um, call my number. I'll put it out there again, 443-521-3336. I would love for you to call me and just say, man, I made that decision. What's next? What does that mean? I'd love to have that conversation. So again, love you guys. I pray that we have a burning desire to be the church to be like the church that we see in Scripture. I pray that we go home and we really think about all the past um, messages that we've looked at and, and how they impact our lives. We should be asking ourselves the question, these six characteristics that we see in the Scriptures, you know, of, of worship and prayer and getting into the Scriptures and service and all these things, are they characteristics of my life? Is this the way that I'm living my life? Is this the way that we're living together? And then we pray that, man, God would help us to live that way. So um, anyway, I love you guys. Um, Great to spend time with you here. Look forward to doing this way more often. We've been talking about ways we can get together and have more interaction and build relationships. So um, look to be a part of that. So anyway, love you guys. Talk to you later.